Hmm. There we are. Hi, everybody. It Hi. Is, it is a rainy Saturday evening here. In warm. Einstein very High warm. Very warm. We'll take that. All right. Mm -hmm. We've uh, had a very busy day of uh, moving fruit trees around on Carol's Animal Crossing Island. So, as you can tell, we're both very exhausted. We are doing The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. And uh, art by Dave McKean. Thank you. Good. Down the street and up the hill came the Duke of Westminster, the Honorable Archibald Fitzhugh, and the Bishop of Bath and Wells, slipping and bounding from shadow to shadow, lean and leathery, all sinews and cartilage, wearing raggedy clothes all a tatter. And they bounded and loped and skulked, leapfrogging over dustbins, keeping to the dark side of the hedges. Are they dead? I. They were small. Well, this is the first we're meeting them. They were small, like full-size people who had shrunk in the sun. <laughs> Shrinky dinks. They spoke to each other in undertones, saying things like, If your grace has any more blooming idea of where we is than us do, I'd be grateful if he'd say so. Otherwise, he should keep his big awful hole shut. And all I'm saying, your worship, is that I know there's a graveyard near to here. I can smell it. And... If you could smell it, then I should be able to smell it, because I got a better nose than you have, your grace. All this as they dodged and wove their way through suburban gardens. <coughs> they avoided one garden. Psst. Hissed the Honorable Archibald Fitzhugh. Dogs! And ran along the top of the garden wall, scampering over it like rats the side of size of children. <laughs> down onto the high street and up the road to the top of the hill. And then they were at the graveyard wall and they went up it like squirrels up a tree and they sniffed the air. Where dog, said the Duke of Westminster. Where? I don't know. Somewhere around here. Doesn't smell like a proper dog anyway, said the Bishop of Bath and Wells. Somebody couldn't smell this graveyard neither, said the Honorable Archibald Fitz. You remember, it's just a dog. The three of them leapt down the wall to the ground and they ran using their arms as much as their legs to propel themselves through the graveyard to the ghoul gate by the lightning tree. And beside the gate in the moonlight they paused. Uh, when's, what's this when it's, what's this when it's at home then? Asked the Bishop of Bath and Wells. Lamy, said the Duke of Westminster. Bod woke then. The three faces staring into his could have been those of mummified humans, fleshless and dry, but their features were mobile and interesting. Mouths that grinned to reveal sharp, stained teeth, bright, beady eyes, clawed fingers that moved and tapped. Who are you? Bod asked. We, said one of the creatures. They were, Bod realized, only a little bigger than he was. It is most important folk we is. Here is the Duke of Westminster. The biggest of the creatures gave a bow saying, Charmed, I'm sure. And this is the Bishop of Bath and Wells. The creature which grinned sharp teeth and let a pointed tongue of improbable length waggle between them did not look like Bod's idea of a bishop. Its skin was piebald and had a large spot across one eye masking it, look almost making it look almost piratical. And I have the honor to be their honorable Archibald Fitzhugh at your service. The three creatures bowed as one. The Bishop of Bath and Wells said, Now me, lad, what's your story, eh? And don't tell any porkies, remember how you're talking to a bishop. You tell him, your worship, said the other two. So Bob told them. He told them how no one like him. No, liked him. No one liked him or wanted to play with him. How no one appreciated him or cared, and how even his guardian had abandoned him. Blow me down, said the Duke of Westminster, scratching his nose. A little dried up thing that was mostly nostrils. What you need is to go somewhere the people would appreciate you. There isn't anywhere, said Bod, and I'm not allowed out of the graveyard. What you need is an old world of friends and playfellows, said the Bishop of Bath and Wells, wiggling his long tongue. A city of delights, of fun and magic, where you'll be appreciated, not ignored. Bod said, the lady who's looking after me, she makes horrible food, hard-boiled eggs, soup and things. Food, said the Honorable Archibald Fitzhugh. 
where we're going, the food's the best in the whole world. Makes me tongue rumble and mouth water just thinking about it. Can I come with you? Asked Bod. Come with us, said the Duke of Westminster. He sounded shocked. Don't be like that, your grace, said Bishop of Wells and Beth. I have a blink in art. Look at the little mite. Hadn't had a decent meal in you, I don't know how long. I vote to take him, said the Honorable Archibald Fitzhugh. There's a good grub back at our place. He patted his stomach to show just how good the food was. So, you game for adventure, said the Duke of Westminster, won over by the novel idea. Or do you want to waste the rest of your life here, he pointed with bony fingers as he indicated the graveyard in the night. Bob thought of Miss Lepescu and her awful food and her list and her pinched mouth. I'm game, he said. His three new friends might have been his size, but they were far stronger than any child, and Bob found himself picked up by the Bishop of Bath and Wells and held high above the creature's head, while the Duke of Westminster grabbed a handful of mangy-looking grass, shouted what <laughs> sounded like, Scotty, Kavanaugh, and pulled. The stone slab that covered the grave swung open like a trap door, revealing a darkness beneath. Quick now, said the Duke. And the Bishop of Bath and Wells tossed Bod into the dark opening and leapt in after him, followed by the Honorable Archibald Fitzhugh. And then with one agile bound, the Duke of Westminster, who soon, as he was inside, called out, Wake Rodus! To close the ghoul gate and the stone crashed uh -oh. down. Bod fell, tumbling through the darkness like a lump of marble, too startled to be scared, wondering how deep the hole beneath that grave could possibly be when... Two strong hands caught him beneath the armpits, and he found himself swinging forward through the pitch blackness. Bod had not experienced total darkness for many, many years. In the graveyard, he saw as the Dead Sea, and no tomb or grave or crypt was truly dark to him. Now, he was in utter darkness, feeling himself being pitched forward in a sequence of jerks and rushes, the wind rushing past him. It was frightening. But it was also exhilarating. And then there was light, and everything changed. The sky was red, but not the warm red of a sunset. This was an angry, glowering red and the color of an infected wound. Mm. The sun was small and seemed like it was old and distant. The air was cold, and they were descending a wall. Tombstones and statues jutted out of the sides of the wall as if a huge graveyard had been upended and like three wizened chimpanzees in tattered black suits that did up the back, the Duke of Westminster, the Bishop of Bath and Wells, and the Honorable Archibald Fitzhugh were swinging from statue to stone, dangling Bob between them as they went, tossing him from one another, never missing him, always catching him with these, and not even looking. Bob tried to look up to see where the graves through which they would enter this strange world, but he could see nothing but headstones. He wondered if each of the graves they were swinging past was a door for the kind of people who were carrying him. Where are we going? He asked, but his voice was whipped away by the wind. They went faster and faster. Up ahead of them, Bond saw a statue swing up and another two creatures came catapulting out of this crimson skied world, just like the ones that carried Bond. One wore a raggedy silken gown that looked like it had once been white. The other wore a stained gray suit too large for it, and the sleeves of which were shredded in the shadowy tatters. They spotted Bod and his three new friends and made for them, dropping 20 feet with ease. The Duke of Westminster gave a guttural squawk and pretended to be scared, and Bod and the three of them swung down the walls of the grave with the two new creatures in pursuit. None of them seemed to get tired out of breath under that red sky with burnt out sun gazing down at them like a dead eye. But eventually they fetched up on the side of the huge statue of a creature whose face seemed to have become a fungoid growth. Bod found himself being introduced to the 33rd president of the United States and the emperor of China. This, this is Master Bod, said the Bishop of Bath and Wells. He is going to become one of us. He's in search of a good meal, said the Honorable Archibald Fitzhugh. Well, you're guaranteed fine dining when you become one of us, young lad, said the Emperor of China. Yep, yep. said the 33rd President of the United States. Bob said, I become one of you? You mean I turn into you? 
smart as a whip, sharp as a tack, and you have to get up pretty late at night to put anything past this lad, said the Bishop of Wales. Indeed, one of us, as strong, as fast, as unconquerable. Teeth so strong they can crush any bones. A tongue sharp and long enough to lift the marrow of the deepest marrow bone or flay the fish. Flesh from a fat man's face, said the Emperor of China, able to slip from shadow to shadow, never seen, never suspected, free as air, fast as, fast as, and fast as thought, cold as frost, hard as nails, dangerous as, as us, said the Duke of Westminster. Bob looked at the creatures, but what if I don't want to be one of you, he said. Don't want to. Of course you want to. What could be finer? I don't think there's a soul in the universe who doesn't want to be just like us. We've got the best city. Gulheim, said the 33rd president of the United States. The best life, the best food. Can you imagine, interrupted the bishop in Bath and Wales, how fine a drink the black ichor that collects in a leaden coffin. Oh, Ugh, you can do it. Can be. Or how it feels to be more important than kings and queens. How presidents or prime. Sorry. Prime. Ministers. I lost my place when you moved my arm. Ministers or heroes to be sure of it. And in the same way that people are more important than Brussels sprouts. Bob said, what are you people? Ghouls, said the Bishop of Bath and Wells. Bless me. Somebody wasn't paying attention, was he? We're ghouls. Look. Below them, a whole troop of the little creatures were bouncing and running and leaping, heading for the path below them. And before he could say another word, he was snatched up by a pair of bony hands. It was flying through the air in a series of jumps and lurches as the creatures headed down to meet the others of their kind. The wall of graves was ending, and now there was a road, nothing but a road. A much trodden path across a barren plain, a desert of rocks and bones that wound towards the city high on a huge red rock many miles away. Bod looked up at the city and was horrified. An emotion engulfed him that mingled repulsion and fear, disgust and loathing, all tinged with shock. Ghouls do not build. They are parasites and scavengers, eaters of carrion. The city they call Gulheim is something they found long ago, but did not make. No one knows, if any human ever knew, what kind of creatures it was that made those buildings, who honeycombed the rock with tunnels and towers. But it is certain that no one but the ghoul folk could have wanted to stay there or, or even to approach that place. Even from the path below, Gulheim seemed miles away. Bob could see that all of the angles were wrong. That the walls sloped crazily and it was every nightmare he had ever endured made into a place like a huge mouth of jutting teeth. It was a city that had been built just to be abandoned, in which all the fears and madnesses and revulsions of the creatures who built it were made into stone. The ghoul folk had found it and delighted in it, called it home. Ghouls moved fast. They swarmed along the path through the desert more swiftly than a vulture flies, and Bod was carried along by them, held high overhead by a pair of strong ghoul arms, tossed from one to another, feeling sick, feeling dread and dismay, feeling stupid. Above them in the sour red skies, things were circling on huge black wings. Careful, said the Duke of Westminster. Tuck him away. Don't want the night gone stealing him, bloody stealers. Yeah, we hate stealers, shouted the Emperor of China. Night gods in the red sky above Gulenheim. Bod took a deep breath and shouted just as Miss Lepesco had taught him. He made a call like an eagle's cry <coughs> in the back of his throat. One of the winged beasts dropped towards them, circled lower, and Bod made the call again until it was stifled by hard hands clamping over his mouth. Good idea calling them down, said the Honorable Archibald Fitzhugh, but trust me, they aren't edible until they've been rotting at least a couple of weeks. They just cause us trouble. No love lost between our side and theirs, eh? The night gaunt rose again in the dry desert air to rejoin its fellows, and Bod felt all hope. Vanish. The ghoul sped on towards the city on the rocks, and Bod now flung M ceremoniously over the stinking shoulders of the Duke of Westminster was carried with them. 
The dead sun set and two moons rose, one huge and pitted and white, which seemed as it rose to be taking up half the horizon, although it shrank as it ascended, and a smaller moon, the bluish green color of the veins of mold in a cheese, and the arrival of this moon was an occasion of celebration for the ghoul folk. They stopped marching and made a camp beside the road. One of the new members of the band, Bob thought it might have been the one he had been introduced to as the famous writer, Victor Hugo, produced a sack which turned out to be filled with firewood, several pieces with the hinges still or brass handles attached, along with metal cigarette lighter, soon made a fire all around which the ghoul folk sat and rested. They stared up at the greenish blue moon, scuffled for the best place by the fire, insulting each other, sometimes clawing or biting. <clears throat> we'll sleep soon, then off for Ghoulheim at Moonset, said the Duke of Westminster. It's just another nine or ten hours run along the way. We should reach it by next moonrise. Then we'll have a party, eh? Celebrate you being made into one of us. It doesn't hurt said the Honorable Archibald Fitzhugh. Not so as you'd notice. And after, think how happy you'll be. They all started telling stories then of how fine and wonderful a thing it was to be a ghoul, of all the things they had crunched up and swallowed down with their powerful teeth. Impervious they were to disease or illness, said one of them. Why, it didn't matter what their dinner had died of. They could just chomp it down. They told of the places they'd been, which mostly seemed to be catacombs and plague pits. Plague pits is good eating, said the emperor of China. Everyone agreed. They told Bod how they'd gotten their names and how he, in turn, once he became a nameless ghoul, would be named as they had been. But I don't want to become one of you, said Bod. One way or another, said the bishop of Bath and Wells, Charity, you'll become one of us. The other way is messier, involves being digested, and you're not really around very long to enjoy it. But that's not a good thing to talk about, said the Emperor of China. Best to be a ghoul. We're afraid of nothing. And all the ghouls around the coffinwood fire howled at this statement and growled and sang and exclaimed at how wise they were and how mighty and how fine it was to be scared of nothing. There was a noise then from the desert, from far away, a distant howl. And the ghouls gibbered, and they huddled closer to the flames. What was that? asked Bod. The ghouls shook their heads. It's something out in the desert, whispered one of them. Quiet, it'll hear us. And all the ghouls were quiet for a bit until they forgot about the thing in the desert and began singing ghoul song filled with foul words and worse sentiments. And the most peculiar, popular of which were simple lists of which rotting body parts were to be eaten and in what order. I want to go home, said Bod, when the last of the bits in the song had been consumed. I don't want to be here. Don't take so on so, said the Duke of Westminster. Why, you little coot, I promise as soon as you're one of us, you'll not ever remember that you even had a home. I, I don't remember anything about the days before I was a ghoul, said the finest, finest famous writer, Victor Hugo, nor I said the emperor of China proudly. Nope, said the 33rd president of the United States. You'll be one of a select band of the cleverest, strongest, bravest creatures ever, bragged the bishop of Bath and Wales. Bob was unimpressed by the ghoul's bravery or their wisdom. They were strong, though, and inhumanly fast, and he was in the center of a troop of them. Making a break for it would have been impossible. They would have been able to catch up with him before he could cover a dozen yards. Far off in the night, something howled once more and the ghouls moved closer to the fire. Bog could hear them sniffling and cursing. He closed his eyes, miserable and homesick. He did not want to become one of the ghouls. He wondered how he would ever be able to sleep when he was this worried and hopeless, and then almost to his surprise, for two or three hours, he slept. A noise woke him, upset, loud, close. It was someone saying, Well, where is they, eh? He opened his eyes to see the Bishop of Bath and Wells shouting at the Emperor of China. It seemed that a couple of the members of their group had disappeared in the night, just vanished, and no one had an explanation. The rest of the ghouls were on edge. They packed up their camp quickly, and the 33rd president of the United States picked Bod up, bundled him under his shoulder. The ghouls 
scrabbled back down the rocky cliffs to the road beneath the sky the color of bad blood, and they headed toward Gulheim. They seemed significantly less exuberant this morning. Now they seemed, at least to Bod, as he was bounced along, to be running away from something. Around midday, with a dead-eyed sun high overhead, the ghouls stopped and huddled. Ahead of them, high in the sky, circling on the hot air currents were the night gaunts, dozens of them riding the thermals. The ghouls divided into two fractions. Factions. There were those who felt that the vanishing of their friends was meaningless, and those who believed something, probably one of the night gaunts, was out to get them. They came to no agreement, except for a general agreement to arm themselves with rocks to throw at the night gaunts, so they descend, and they filled the pockets of their suits and robes with pebbles from the desert floor. Something howled off in the desert to their left, and the ghouls eyed each other. It was louder than the night before, and closer, a deep, wolfish howl. Did you hear that? asked the mayor of London. Nope, said the 33rd president of the United States. Me neither said the Honorable Archibald Fitzhugh. The howl came again. We got to get home, said the Duke of Westminster, hefting a large stone. The nightmare city of Gulenheim sat on a rocky high outcrop ahead of them, and the creatures loped down the road towards it. Not God's coming, said the Bishop of Bath and Wells. Throw stones at the bleeders. Bob's view of things was upside down at this point, bouncing up and down on the back of the 33rd president of the United States. Gritty sand from the path blown up into his face, but he heard cries like eagle cries. And once again, Bob called for help in night gaunt. You want to try it again? That. Okay. No, okay. no one tried to stop him this time, but he was not sure that anyone could have heard him over the cries of the night gaunts or the oaths and curses of the ghoul folk as they pitched and flung their stones into the air, Bod heard the howling again. Now it came from their right. There's dozens of the blooming blinkers, said the Duke of Westminster gloomily. 33rd president of the United States handed Bod over to the famous writer Victor Hugo, who threw the boy into his sack, put it under his shoulder. Bod was just as glad the set smelled of nothing worse than dirty wood. They're retreating, shouted a ghoul. Look at him go. Don't you worry, boy, said a voice that sounded to Bod like the Bishop of Bath and Wells near the sack. There won't be any of this nonsense when we get you to Ghoulheim. It's impenetrable, this Ghoulheim. Bod could not tell if any of the ghouls had been killed or injured fighting the night gaunts. He suspected from the imprecations of the Bishop of Bath and Wells that several more of the ghouls might have run off. Quickly! shouted someone who was probably the Duke of Westminster, and the ghouls set off at a run. Bod in the sack was uncomfortable, being painfully slammed into the famous writer Victor Hugo's back and occasionally banged on the ground. To make his time in the sack even more uncomfortable, there were several lumps of wood, not to mention sharp screws and nails in there with him, and final remnants of coffin base firewood. A screw was just under his hand, digging into him, Despite being jogged and bounced, jostled and jarred in every one of his capture steps, Bob managed to grab, grasp the screw in his right hand. He felt the tip of it, sharp to the touch. He hopped, hoped deep inside. Then he pushed the screw into the fabric of the sack behind him and worked the sharp end in, and then pulling it back, made another hole a little away from the first. From behind, he could hear something howl once more, and it occurred to him that anything that could terrify the ghoul folk must itself be even more terrifying than he could imagine. And for a moment, he stopped stabbing with the screw. What if he fell from the sack into the jaws of some evil beast? But at least if he died, thought Bod, he would have died as himself with all his memories, knowing who his parents were, who Silas was, even who Miss Lepescu was. And that was good. He attacked the sacking with his brass screw again, jabbing and pushing until he'd made another hole in the fabric. Come on, lads, shouted the Bishop of Bath and Wells. Up the steps and then we're home. We're all safe in Goldenheim. Hurrah, your worship, called someone else, probably the Honorable Archibald Fitzhugh. Now the motion of his captors had changed. It was no longer a forward motion. Now it was a sequence of movements, up and along, up and along. Bob pushed at the sacking with his hand, tried to make an eye hole. He looked out above the drear red sky below. He looked out 
Above the drear, drear red sky, below, he could see the desert floor, but now it was hundreds of feet below him. There were steps stretching out behind them, steps that were made for giants, and the ochre wall, rock wall to his right, Gullenheim, which Bob could not see from where he was, had to be above them. To his left was a sheer drop. He was going to have to fall straight down, he decided, onto the steps, and he would just hope the ghouls would notice that he was making <laughs> his break for it in their desperation to be home and safe. He saw night guns high in the red sky, hanging back, circling. He was pleased to see there were no other ghouls behind him. The famous writer Victor Hugo was bringing up the rear, and no one was behind him to alert the ghouls to the hole that was growing in the sack or to see Bob if he fell out. But there was something else. Bob was bounced onto his side away from the hole, but he had seen something huge and gray on the steps beneath pursuing them. He could hear an angry growling noise. Mr. Owens had an expression for two things he found equally unpleasant. I'm between the devil and the deep blue sea, he would say. Bob had wondered what this meant, having seen in his life in the graveyard neither the devil nor the deep blue sea. I'm between the ghouls and the monster, he and thought. And as he thought it, sharp canine teeth caught at the sack, pulling at it until fabric tore along the ribs. Bob had made. The boy tumbled out onto the rock stair, where a huge gray animal, like a dog but far larger, growled and drooled and stood over him. An animal with flaming eyes and white fangs and huge paws. It panted. It stared at Bob. Ahead of him, the ghouls had stopped. Bloody Nora, said the Duke of Westminster. That hellhound's got the blinking boy. Let it have him, said the Emperor of China. Run! Yikes, said the 33rd President of the United States. The ghouls ran up the steps. Bod was now certain that the steps had been carved by giants, for each step was higher than he was. As they fled, the ghouls paused only to turn and make rude gestures at the beach, possibly also at Bod. The beast stayed where, stayed where it was. It's going to eat me, Bod thought bitterly. Smart Bod. And he thought of his home in the graveyard. And now he could no longer remember why he had ever left. Monster dog or no monster dog, he had to get back home once more. There were people waiting for him. He pushed past the beast, jumped down to the next step four feet below, fell his height, landed on it, felt, fell his height, landed on his ankle, which twisted underneath him painfully, and he dropped heavily onto the rock. He could hear the beast running, jumping down towards him. He tried to wiggle away to pull himself up onto his feet, but his ankle was useless now, numb and in pain, and before he could stop himself, he fell again. He fell off the step away from the rock wall out into space, off the cliffside where he dropped, a nightmarish tumble down distances that Bob could not even imagine. And as he fell, he was certain he heard a voice coming in the general direction of the gray beast, and it said in Miss Lepescu's voice, Oh, Bob! It was like... Every dream of falling he had ever had, a scared and frantic drop through space as he headed towards the ground below. Bob felt as though his mind was only big enough for one huge thought. So that big dog was actually Miss Lepescu, and I'm going to hit the rock floor. And splat, competed in his head for occupation. Something wrapped itself around him, falling at the same speed he was falling. And then there was the loud flapping of leathery wings and everything slowed. The ground no longer seemed to be heading toward him at the same speed. The wings flapped harder. They lifted slightly. And now the only thought in Bob's head was, I'm flying. And he was. He turned his head. Above him was a dark brown head, perfectly bald, with deep eyes that looked as they were polished slabs of black glass. Bod made the screeching noise that means help in Night Gaunt, and the Night Gaunt smiled and made deep hooting noise in return. It seemed pleased. A swoop and a slow, and they touched down on the desert floor with a thump. Bod tried to stand up, and his ankle betrayed him once again, sent him stumbling down into the sand. The wind was high, and the sharp desert sand blew hard, sting stinging Bod's skin. The Night Gaunt crouched beside him, its leathery wings folded on its back. Bod had grown up in a graveyard and was used to images of winged people, but the angels on the headstones looked nothing like this. And now, bounding towards them across the desert floor in the shadow of Gulenheim, 
a large, huge gray beast, like an enormous dog. The dog spoke in Miss Lepescu's voice. It said, this is the third time the night gods have saved your life, Bod. The first was when you called for help and they heard. They got the message you, to me, telling me when where you were. The second was around the fire last night when you were asleep. They were circling in the darkness and heard a couple of the ghouls saying you were ill luck for them. That's what, that they should have beat your brains out with a rock, but put you somewhere where they could find you again. Then you were properly rotted down. Then they would eat you. The night gaunts dealt with the matter silently. Now this. Miss Lepescu? The great dog-like head lowered towards him. And for one mad fear-filled moment, he thought she was going to take a bite out of him. But her tongue licked the side of his face affectionately. You hurt your ankle? Yes, I can't stand on it. Let's get you onto my back, said the great huge beast that was Miss Lepescu. She said something in not gaunt screeching tongue and it came over and held Bod up while he put his arms around Miss Lepescu's neck. Hold my fur, she said. Hold tight. Now, before we go, say. She made a high screech noise. What does that mean? Thank you. Or goodbye, both. Bod screeched as best he could and the night gaunt made an amused chuckle. Then it made a similar noise and spread its great leathery rings, wings and ran into the desert wind, flapping hard. The wind caught it and carried it aloft like a kite that had begun to fly. Now, said the beast that was Miss Lepescu, hold on tightly. She began to run. Are we going to the wall of graves? To the ghoul gates? No, those are for ghouls. I'm a hound of God. I travel my own road into hell and out of it. And it seemed to Bob that she ran even faster then. The huge moon rose and the smaller mold-colored moon, and they were joined by a ruby red moon. And the gray wolf ran at a steady lope beneath them across the desert of bones. She stopped by a broken clay building like an enormous beehive built beside a small rill of water that came bubbling out of the desert rock, splashed down into a tiny pool, and was gone again. The gray wolf put her head down and drank, and Bob scooped water up in his hands, drinking the water in a dozen tiny gulps. This is the boundary, said the gray wolf. That was Miss Lepescu, and Bob looked up. The three moons had gone. Now he could see the Milky Way, see it as if he had never seen it before. A glimmering shroud across the arch of the sky. The sky was filled with stars. They're beautiful, said Bob. When we get home, said Miss Lepescu, I'll teach you the name of stars and their constellations. I like that, admitted Bod. Bod clambered onto her huge gray back once more and he buried his face in her fur and held on tightly. And it seemed only moments later that he was being carried awkwardly as a grown woman carries a six-year-old boy across the graveyard to the Owens's tomb. He's hurt his ankle, Miss Lepescu was saying. Poor little soul, said Mrs. Mistress Owens, taking the boy from her and cradling him in her capable, if insubstantial, arms. I can't say I didn't worry, for I did, but he's back now. That's all that matters. And then he was perfectly comfortable beneath the earth in a good place with his head on his own pillow and a gentle, exhausted darkness took him. Bob's left ankle was swollen and purple. Dr. Trefusis, 1817 to 1936, may he wake to glory, <laughs> <laughs> inspected it and pronounced it merely sprained. Miss Lepescu returned from a journey to the chemist with a tight ankle bandage, and Josiah Worthington, Bart, who had been buried with his ebony walking cane, insisted on lending it to Bod, who had too much fun leaning on the stick and pretending to be 100 years old. Bod limped up the hill and retrieved a folded piece of paper from beneath a stone. The Hounds of God, he read. It was printed in purple ink and was the first item on the list. Those men that call, those that men call werewolves or lycanthropes call themselves the Hounds of God as they claim their transformation is a gift from their creator and they repay the gift with their tenacity for they will pursue an evildoer to the very gates of hell. Bod nodded. Not just evildoers, he thought. He read the rest of the list, committing it to memory as best he could. 
then went down to the chapel where Miss Lepescu was waiting for him with a small meat pie and a huge bag of chips she brought from the fish and chip shop at the bottom of the hill and another pile of purple ink duplicate list. The two of them shared the chips once or twice. Miss Lepescu even smiled. Silas came back at the end of the month. He carried his black bag in his left hand and he held his right arm stiffly. But he was Silas and Bob was glad to see him and even happier when Silas gave him a present, a little model of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. It was almost midnight and still not fully dark. The three of them sat at the top of the hill with the lights of the city glimmering beneath them. I trust that all went well in my absence, said Silas. I learned a lot, said Bob, still holding his bridge. He pointed up into the night sky. That's Orion the Hunter up there with his belt of three stars. And that's Taurus the Bull. Very good, said Silas. And you, asked Bod, did you learn anything while you were away? Oh, yes, said Silas, but he declined to elaborate. I also, said Miss Lepescu primly, I also learned things. Good, said Silas. An owl hooted in the branches of the oak tree, you know, I heard rumors while I was away, said Silas, that some weeks ago you both went somewhere further afield than I would have been able to follow. Normally I would advise caution, but unlike some, the ghoul folk have short memories. Bob said, oh, it's okay. Miss Lepescu looked after me. I was never in any danger. Miss Lepescu looked at Bob and her eyes shone and she looked at Silas. There are many things to know, she said. Perhaps I'd come back next year in high summer to teach the boy again. Silas looked at Miss Lepescu and raised an eyebrow fraction. Then he looked at Bod. I'd like that, said Bod. Oh, there we go. A long one. Whew. Reading The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. Yes, that was a whole half hour that and was six a minutes. Whole, that was a whole mighty, mighty chunk there. Um, so uh, we're going to wrap it up. Sorry. We will be back here tomorrow evening at 530. Um, did we introduce ourselves? Clint Carroll. Yeah, good enough. Stay safe, stay healthy, and choose joy. <laughs> Happy Saturday.